Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, Mark kindly did introduce me in those terms, um, having had a firm instruction from the, everyone at the Arts Council to call me Sir Nicholas, which of course everyone does every time I appear at the Arts Council. <laughs> um, I just want to begin really by congratulating everyone on the day with no boundaries, both in Manchester and in Hull. And I want to thank everyone who's been involved in organizing today's session and tomorrow, because we've already seen today some really remarkable provocations and discussions. And I've learned a lot, and I think everyone in the audience will have learned a lot. I want to thank um, Jamie Bedard for reminding me that I am a white, male, <laughs> middle-class Londoner. <laughs> Um, I want to thank Judy Clark for reminding me that I'm archaic. Um, but most of all, I want to thank everyone here for attending today. And I want to thank um, Hull Truck for hosting. But I want to thank Hull um, for being the most successful city of culture. And I want to congratulate um, Rosie Millard and Martin Green and Van Hagee, and of course, um, the vision of the city led by Stephen Brady, who have created this really remarkable success. Going to the forums this afternoon and hearing that the audience numbers, which they had hoped re would reach 150,000 in the course of the year, have already been met, tells you everything about the success. And I don't think it was a question of them under forecasting. It really was quite simple and overachieving. I think it is quite simply remarkable what has been uh, done here so far in the co course of the year. And of course, No Boundaries is now really very, very well established as a forum for provocation and discussion. So the combination of Hull and No Boundaries um, made it natural in a way that I should want to use this venue as the place to give my first speech as chair of the Arts Council. Um, I want to begin by paying tribute to my predecessors, Liz Forgan and Pisa Bazalgette, because they've left the Arts Council in such good shape. And they've done so much, personally, to raise awareness, politically and publicly, about the significance of the arts, museums and libraries in all our lives. Along with Darren Henley and um, Alan Davey, Baz has made a strong case for public investment in the arts through describing the benefits, personal, educational, social, and economic, that are the evidence of the power of art in society as a whole. It was appropriate that Baz's last talk before leaving was about the arts and empathy, because the arts open our eyes to the experience of others but also allow us to express our common humanity. So I've joined an organization with strong values and a belief that the work we do and the artists and arts organizations and arts that we support can change lives for the better. And coming from the Tate, I share these values. Frances Morris will be speaking tomorrow and I'm sure she will express those. I want to see the arts, museums and libraries not only recognised as being vital to our lives, I want to see them play an ever, even more present, prominent part in the life of all the nation. So a first speech is a significant moment. There are so many aspects of the Arts Council's work that I want to talk about and ask questions about, and I will do that. How do I see the Arts Council pursuing the two great aspirations of excellence and access? My work at the Tate has strengthened my belief that both can be combined without compromise to either. And I've seen many examples already among the work that the Arts Council supports and invests in. I'd also like to talk about the work done by individual cultural organisations, cultural entrepreneurs, large and small, from theatre and dance to literature, to the visual arts, libraries and museums, in concert halls, on the street, 
and in the ever-expanding digital experience. And I'm not going to promise too many hoax footballers for you, <laughs> but I know that the Arts Council, and we were not looking at the space when we were, or nor were we seeing a production from the space when we saw um, those images earlier of Rex Seco, but nevertheless, the Arts Council will play an important part in the digital realm. I'd like to reflect on the work of artists, individuals, writers, composers and performers, directors and producers, curators and librarians. Can the Arts Council do more to support them? And can we find ways to promote the flow of ideas and talent between the public and the commercial sectors, creating opportunities that will result in a more creative and resilient sector. I want to discuss the challenges we face in becoming more diverse, more inclusive, and more representative of society across our programming, audiences, staff, and boards. As Britain prepares to leave the European Union, I want to talk about the positive role the arts can play on the international stage, bringing people together in dialogue and debate I believe that cultural exchange across borders can generate some of the most exciting new art and can help us to understand and find ways to talk about the problems facing humanity. And I need to voice long-term concerns about public investment and especially the loss of local authority funding, which is now the most pressing issue day to day for many cultural organizations across the country. All of these subjects need addressing, and I'll come to them in due course. Today, however, it's a unique opportunity to think about some of the guiding principles for our future. I want to reflect on three areas that I want to be at the heart of our work at the Arts Council, so that art and culture can have a growing and enduring place in our lives as individuals, as members of a community and in our national life. First, it's important to talk about the experience of art and how in its many different forms can enable people to discover their own identities and to express their hopes and emotions to others. Secondly, how these life-changing opportunities should be more available to those who have little or no access to the arts, and we've been talking about that today. And thirdly, I want to affirm the fundamental place of the arts and of creativity in education. I know this last remains contested ground, but we should recognize that young people have a right to a broad, high quality education which involves a creative as well as an academic training. In a rapidly changing world in which appearances can not always be trusted, as we saw earlier today, we need people who can question, adapt, and invent, as well as analyze and use existing knowledge. This will involve a new approach, and later I shall be sharing some news with you. First, the arts change lives. I think everyone here today, for everyone, there would have been a moment when hearing a piece of music, reading a book, seeing a particular play, or looking at a painting or sculpture gave us a new insight into our own sensibilities and stimulated new ways of thinking about the world, helping to shape our values. I can still remember the shock and thrill of seeing Peter Brook's radical staging of Shakespeare's A Midsummer Night's Dream at the RSC in 1970. I said I was archaic. <laughs> or the wonder of first encountering the lyrics of Bob Dylan, Joan Byers, and Leonard Cohen, whose words seemed to speak directly in those mid-60s years to my own experience and feelings about the world. Many of those discoveries came through chance conversations recommendations, exchange of postcards and messages with friends. 
what would now be social media, but then a little slower. My parents were not passionate about the arts, though I do have to thank my father for taking me to see the great Picasso exhibition at the Tate in 1960, an experience that he was certain would discourage me from taking any future interest, <laughs> any, fu any future interest in modern art. It was a cunning plan, but as you know, it failed miserably. I was entranced by the blue period and social realism, and puzzled by the language of Cubism and bowled over by the studies for Guernica, Picasso's cry of pain about the brutality of civil war and a painting that continues, and for very obvious reasons, to resonate to the present day. We know that investment in art and culture brings benefits socially and economically. That's what we're seeing in Hull. But we must never forget that the arts are first about, that, of, about the magic of that individual encounter, the special experience that changes our view of the world or our understanding of ourselves. The chance to have this kind of encounter should not be limited by social, educational, or economic privilege. I believe that our job at the Arts Council is to identify and support the best of art and culture, whatever discipline and form that assumes, and to create opportunities for everyone to step beyond their own experience, whether by taking part or as a member of an audience. This brings me to my second point, the important role that we can all play in areas of the country where, level of, where the level of engagement with the arts is still very low. Opportunity should not be limited by where you live. This is especially relevant after the European referendum, which exposed greater differences of belief and of opportunity in society than perhaps we had fully recognized. There were many complicated reasons why people from different social groups and constituencies voted the way they did. Conflicting opinions are uncomfortable. But the arts can play a vital role in expressing and exploring these frictions, helping us to appreciate other positions. However, the frustrations expressed in the referendum have to be addressed notably in those communities that have lost out economically in the past 30 years, places where there is a sense of having been left behind. These are often the places that haven't had a great deal of arts activity or cultural investment, places such as rural areas and or, uh, more obviously perhaps the margins of big cities. Investment in these places can do important things. It can galvanize civic life. It can stimulate economic activity. And, my first point crucially, it can give a voice to individuals who feel that they have not been heard. We've seen this in Hull and in cities, towns, and villages across the country. The Arts Council has long recognized that we need to invest more outside London especially in areas of most need. But we won't do this in a way that jeopardizes London's status as a world center for the arts. To reach people who don't currently have access to the arts, we must look at, at where and indeed how we invest. Historically, the Arts Council has tended to be a responsive funder, waiting on applications from individuals and organizations that are best able to present a case. But in the 21st century, we have to be more proactive and fulfill our role as a development agency. This will involve thinking, as we heard this afternoon, about new ways of bringing money into the arts rather than relying entirely on grant and aid or lottery funding. We must act as a greater catalyst for change taking the initiative by encouraging individuals, organizations, and communities to start, as well as sustain cultural projects in hitherto neglected areas across England. One such example the Arts Council has been running for the past three years, of course, is Creative People and Places. 
Most of you know about this. It began in 2013. It's a 50 million pound program with currently 21 projects across the country in places where people don't generally have access to the arts. Currently, places where there's a less than 20% engagement in the, art, in, in the arts. It helps communities discover their own creativity, to develop the kinds of projects and events that articulate distinct and relevant areas, ideas of local culture. It shows how the arts can make a difference to people's lives. I recently visited Stoke-on-Trent, the six towns that have been much in the news, given the emphatic, their emphatic vote to leave the EU, and of course the by-election caused by Tristram Hunt's move to the VNA. Stoke has a population of nearly 400,000, but for many years its only regularly funded arts organisation has been the New Vic Theatre in Newcastle under Lyme. This theatre has been a brilliant con contributor to the community. When I visited recently, they were about to kick off a performance of Beryl, a play by Maxine Peake about the celebrated Yorkshire cyclist Beryl Burton, which had previously pre been presented at West Yorkshire Playhouse. The theatre in the round was filled with racing bicycles, and there was an exciting buzz from the audience. But its directors, Teresa Heskins and Fiona Wallace know that there are parts of the community that a building-based organisation cannot reach. So over the last three years, the New Vic has worked with community organisations, the local authorities, the universities, Six Towns Radio and numerous other partners to shape a programme called Appetite, for which a series of festivals, performances and participatory projects are funded by the Arts Council as part of Creative People and Places. Appetite, led by Carl Greenwood, encourages people to participate in and sample the arts in their community, building, literally, their appetite. The public has a say in devising the work, using the experience of the Appetite team in inviting artists and ensemble with national and international stature to Stoke. In the first three years, Appetite's work across the Potteries has attracted 45,000 participants, including many volunteers, and audiences of more than 300,000. It's reached out to refugees, to asylum seekers, using the arts to help them become part of the community. I was also struck by the contribution that Appetite has made to the regeneration projects in the centre of Hanley, which are beginning to draw businesses and people back into the town. And Appetite has been part of, the part of the growth in cultural ambition that has encouraged the Council to bid for UK Capital of Culture in 2021. This bid has brought together many local partners, including both universities. Whatever the outcome, the city has gained a greater sense of purpose and a richer cultural life. This is important work, and I want to talk more about this over time and see the Arts Council do more of it. My third point is about achieving engagement in the arts for all young people, both in and out of school, in the curriculum and beyond, what we call cultural education. This is the area that Darren has done so much to promote and we're indebted to him for the way in which he has worked to keep the issue on the political agenda. He's not there. I thought he might be there at that moment. <laughs> um, there are many differing opinions about the state of the arts in schools, and especially in our secondary schools. We're constantly trying to assimilate new surveys and reports Last autumn, for instance, the NUT report, A Curriculum for All, gave us a pretty pessimistic view. And at the beginning of March, a report by Sussex University found that nearly two thirds of teachers interviewed thought that the EBAC had led to a drop in pupils taking GCS, GCSE music. 
One of the report's authors talked about music facing extinction as a subject. But on the other hand, a report from the New Schools Network argued that the proportion of students taking at least one GCE art subject in England was higher in 2015-16 than it had been in 2011-12, as was the total number of arts GCSE entries, provided that you ignore the figures for design and technology. Who should we believe? Everyone's perspective on this issue is heartfelt and matters. Encouragingly, the New Schools Network report suggested that whatever the statistics might show, they believe that the presence of arts in schools was important in creating fully, a fully rounded education for pupils. And significantly, this aspect of the report was endorsed by the arts and education ministers, Matt Hancock and Nick Gibb. There is therefore, I think, a growing, if debated, view that the arts can make a valuable if and even necessary contribution to education. Many would now agree that the best education is a broad, confident one with a strong arts element. That's certainly the case internationally, as, been, as has been pointed out by E.D. Hirsch, whose work has inspired much recent education policy. And that's what the best schools in this country offer, both in the private and in the public sectors. So I think that we're all closer together on this than we perhaps realize. But there remains a wide spectrum of ideas and beliefs about how to make the arts a part of every child's experience. While there's been a running debate about the place of the arts in the national curriculum, most arts and cultural organizations now see learning as an integral part of their work. And if you think that's commonplace. I have to tell you, when I went to the White Chapel in 1976 and appointed someone to work on education, it was regarded as an extraordinary thing to do. So the world has changed, but in my view, not far enough. There have been many complementary programs designed to encourage young people to engage with the arts. Creative Partnerships was an early attempt to bring people into contact with the best. More recently, In Harmony, the Music Education Hubs, the Sorrel Foundation's National Art and Design Saturday Clubs, the work of the Arts Council Bridge Organisations, the Arts Mark and Arts Award schemes have all played a part in raising awareness and participation. But it remains the case that too many pupils lack access to a high quality cultural education and too few universities ask applicants to show that they have an appetite for the arts and the broader humanities as well as the core academic subjects. <coughs> Debate is necessary but we now need to come together to develop programs that will stimulate self-expression and confidence and build confidence in young people and in the next or we face a situation in which the next generation will lack the skills that I believe they will need in the changing world. Given its historic responsibilities and its obligation to the future, the Arts Council must do more to create opportunities for young people to engage with the culture that they inherit, to which they will contribute, and which will, they will leave as a legacy for their own children. We need to encourage everyone in this debate to look for common ground. And so today I'm announcing a commission. It will be a joint inquiry led by the University of Durham and supported by, the Arts, of Arts, supported by Arts Council England. Called the Durham Commission on Creativity and Education, this commission will draw on international evidence and expertise. It will bring together a full range of voices, opinions and perspectives from the worlds of education, the arts, science and culture. It will look at practice and evidence worldwide, examine the record of those pilots that have been tried in different parts of the country over the past 20 years 
and suggest how we might provide an inspiring and creative cultural education for all young people, wherever they may live. It should tackle some of the big questions and not shy away from the difficult ones. For example, what do we mean when we talk about culture for young people? What should be the goals, our goals, in the education of a child in England at a time when we face big economic, social and cultural challenges? What kinds of knowledge will be useful? What skills are young people going to need? Do we want to encourage skills in expression, creative writing, drama, music, dance, design, painting and photography, alongside mathematics, history, English and the humanities? What works and what doesn't amongst the various initiatives and schemes we currently have? And how far can we take these across the country? What role can our theatres, galleries, museums, concert halls and libraries best play in broadening the horizons and lifting the aspirations of young people? I'm looking forward to this commission beginning its work in the early autumn with the aim of reporting back in 2019. I believe that this work will establish firm intellectual and practical foundations for the future involvement of Arts Council England with education. It will provide an overarching context for our existing work with children and young people. And this includes the cultural education challenge through which we are working on the ground to increase the extent and quality of provision. And, of course, the 25-year talent plan, a significant partnership with the De Montfort University, which will explore how a series of planned cultural opportunities that are specific to place can help provide a roadmap for young talent. The Durham Commission will contribute to the work that the Arts Council is beginning this autumn in setting its strategy for the years 2020 to 2030. And if it does its job, it will contribute to a national debate about how we are preparing our children for the challenges of the 21st century. These three areas that I've talked about today are all concerned with the fundamental, intrinsic value of what we do. The belief that an encounter with art and culture can be a catalyst for change in all our lives. I believe that it is through having and sharing these experiences that we become stronger as individuals and as communities and become a fairer nation. Public investment in our arts, our museums and our libraries is an investment in a shared cultural language with many different voices and accents. I want that language to be available to everyone. The Arts Council must continue to listen and talk to those who remain sceptical about the value of the arts. But above all, it must listen to the voices of creative artists, imaginative producers and directors. These, you, are the people who open our eyes, delight our ears, stimulate our minds and appeal to our hearts. They tell us about the traditions, hopes and aspirations of our fellow citizens and help us and can help us negotiate our way through the modern world. We live in a shifting, exciting, but it has to be said, perilous age. But I've always believed that challenges have to be met with imagination and bold action. And I will look to the Arts Council to take the lead. Thank you.